Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here at FlexLogic with Cheng Wang, who's going to talk today about dynamically reconfiguring logic. Cheng, we've heard a lot about dynamically reconfigurable logic for years, but it's always been sort of, you can do this, but it isn't, doesn't really happen dynamically. What's changed? Yeah, I think what, what really changed in our case is we can pre-compile the entire neural network graph beforehand and we can know exactly what the next configuration is going to be while the current configuration is still in flight or is still executing. And that really helped us um, to reduce a lot of the overhead of, of dynamic reconfiguration so we can still have very good throughput um, all the way across the entire model, even though you might need hundreds of configurations just to complete the whole execution. What's held it up in the past? It was, you could do it, but you didn't really go about doing it, right? Yes, I think in the past, the primary cost, I think, was overhead, right? Is, you know, in order to do it efficiently, you either needed too much resources to do this, um, to do this at an extremely fast pace. This was something like Tabula was trying to do for years, right? Or the configuration time was simply too long, like a traditional FPGA, then to rewrite this, over and over again can only take place, you know, very infrequently, like, you know, daily updates for a driver, for example, not, you know, thousand times per second to maintain real life, uh, you know, a, a real time throughput. Chen, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so here is basically a little bit of the underlying uh, logic of our X1 accelerators. So just like traditional accelerators, we have our computational units and we have our memory units, but they're wired a little bit differently. Instead of going through NOx, which generally is what's being used to connect things together, we have what we call a soft logic, which is a reconfigurable component to our fabric, which allow us to have control logic running inside as well as a lot of routing happening at the same time. So, so you can view something like this we have a set of control that's being used to control the, the memory here. So this can be the read address or the read address and control. And that's going to get its data out to its two TPUs. Obviously, we have more than two in our case, but I'm just going to draw two for simplicity uh, sake. So say each one of them is executing you know, on one byte of data and the queue is being set as two byte wide, so we just split the bus in two. So the control that's running soft logic can control the memory to read data, can control the compute uh, units. In this case, both data passes are computing in parallel. And when the outputs are ready, the soft logic will then also implement what we call some activation functions. The output of that activation uh, function that gets routed to another memory to be written, and this memory would be controlled as the address um, of the write. So you can view this as a bit of a glue logic that's used for controlling when to read data, when to compute data, how to steer data, how to activate the data, and finally, how to write the, the data back out to memory. In the real world, what does this buy you? In the real world, in this case, what you get is something that executes exactly like the performance you will get from an ASIC, but this is purely reconfigurable, which means for the very next layer, I can dynamically reconfigure this something to look totally different this to look like something that's totally different um, and just as efficient. You cannot do that with hardware logic. You've got to have soft logic in order, to, in order to get that functionality. So now in the software, you can start programming basically movement, right? Yeah, so basically the software is what programs this entire control path and all the data movement. And this is for just one configuration, right? The software also tells us what the next configuration is going to be. And now I can show you how the next configuration is going to have a complete different rewiring of the control logic and do that functionality very efficiently as well. So why don't you show us how this actually works in the real world? Sure, of course. So now that's for one uh, 
uh, configuration. Let's see how the next configuration will look like. So now, uh, let's say this uh, layer of configuration has finished processing its data and the data has been written into this memory because th this is what the activation was dumping into. So now let's see what the next layer can look like. Now let's say the next layer uh, is a little bit bigger. So each one of these 1D TPUs is now act is now executing a partial product that has to be summed in the very end. So if I don't have soft logic, both of these guys will have to write their data out to a network on chip to be written to memory, to have somebody else read out those memory, add the data, and then write it back out to memory of, you know, again, that's two write, act uh, two write, two write requests, two read requests, and then a final write request. But let's see how this guy can differ. So if you recall, in the, in the previous configuration, the data was written into here. So now I'm going to try to read it with my read address, okay? And um, this case is a little bit different because we are going to um, use two of this 1D uh, TPUs to compute two partial products first. So these two are going to have the same data, but the output are not going to happen at the same time. Um, because we have to be able to add these two partial products together. So say we want this guy to be added to here. What we will what I should do is we will have a slightly delayed version of this so there's time for the data to arrive. And then when this guy gets dumped out, we will actually use a soft logic or another piece of um, dedicated adder logic to perform the addition. And then uh, we can, for example, pipe this again, and then um, do the activation function, and then get it written to the D. So now we have to drive the control, but you will see the control for this guy has to come out one cycle early because it is being piped before it reaches the control for this guy. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the control here, and the software is going to uh, just say I'm going to pipe this control before I send it to here. And of course, this is just to pipe the control for the unload path, so the D out for this will come out a cycle later in the D out for this, so the data can come out aligned, so they can be added on the fly before it gets activated and written to memory. And of course, this is the right address. So as you can see, there is a lot of flexibility I just talked about. We just went from parallel computation of two you know, parallel paths of data to parallel computation of two partial products with the same architecture. And we are talking about now unloading them at different times so we can account for the data travel time of one data path to travel to the other so the data can be perfectly aligned by the time they have to be added. All of these cycle accurate controls are, are, are what the soft logic fabric, the, reconfigure, the, the reconfigurable fabric is able to bias that a traditional architecture will not be able to. It still looks exactly like an optimized ASIC except it's running in reconfigurable fabric. When you're programming this, what do you have to think about? Do you have to take all this into account and really no. understand this? When the compiler designs it and our soft logic team designs all these interfaces, it takes all these pipelineable parameters into account. So it, it, it knows to account for you know, data travel time so you can still have good place and route results. Otherwise, we cannot run at the frequencies that we're running at. So somebody that's programming this actually could be working in something like Python, right? I, absolutely. The, when somebody programs this thing, they're coming from the high-level graph, like the, you know, Python PyTorch generated into Onyx, or or you know, TF TensorFlow generated into TF Lite. All, all these, I would say, start from Python. I ended up with some kind of a graph, and the graph is what's getting compiled onto here. They know nothing about any of these underlying hardware, and frankly, they don't want. To. How does this differ from what an ASIC designer would do? In fact, I would say this is very similar to what an ASIC designer would do. When these soft logic components were designed, they are designed by our, you know, soft logic 
designers that came from high-speed CPUs because all the interface are piped just like the high-speed CPUs will do. All the long data paths are highly pipelined as they travel just like a high-speed CPU will do because in the end of the day, you know, a near one gigahertz FPGA is not that different from a five gigahertz CPU in terms of its design philosophy, right? There's a lot of similarities in this and the software team basically takes these components and then parameterize them for the operators the user needs so that you, it does the correct operation. And then it instantiates these modules, connects them together, and then we have a compiled soft logic that drives this entire configuration. So yes, the RTL is directly compiled by the compiler, but do not confuse this with, say, high-level synthesis. This is very different from high-level synthesis. The compiler is instantiating very specifically designed computational kernels and then parameterizing them and connecting them to give you the entire fabric, which is a high performance design. Cheng Wang, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. It's always a pleasure.